so today we're going to look at a few vertex shaders. Now they're very simple and if you look at these and you think, well I could probably do that easier just by moving the sprite or scaling the sprite or using a line 2D, you're probably right. But these are examples to show how the shader language works and hopefully you can build on them in the future to make more complicated shaders that will do more interesting things than just a simple line 2D. So the first one we'll look at is this one that's squashing. We'll change it a few different ways. Um, and then we're going to have one that actually appears to show where you are outside of the screen. And this line is just going to follow the player around. I should mention that a lot of my examples I've been translating from a website called The Book of Shaders. And I encourage you to take a look at it, but you should also keep in mind that all of the code there has to be translated into Godot specific shader language. So the first thing we need to make sure we know is that the vertex shader and the fragment shader are very different. So the vertex shader picks points or the vertices and it will adjust those by whatever formula you plug in. Now a fragment shader goes through every pixel. It has more to do with the color and the vertex has more to do with the shape. We have to have the shader type canvas item We'll have to get the sprite size, or how big the icon is. In this case, the Godot icon is 64 by 64. The first one I'll show you is just one that squashes it. So this vertex Y means that we're going to adjust each Y coordinate of each vertex. So here, 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 and here. And what we're going to do is we're going to add the UV to it. Now remember, the UV is at the top going to be 0 and at the bottom going to be 1 since we're only doing with the y uv. So I, I took 1 minus that uv so that way the top would move more than the bottom. If you would actually just take the negative uv it would squish towards the top. We're going to stick with this and the reason why it keeps oscillating back and forth is I'm taking the absolute value of sine of time. So when you think about these numbers, you'll, when you look at shaders, you'll notice a lot of these great big long formulas that have the sine of the absolute of the dot product of all these things. And really all they're doing is trying to get a number that is probably between 0 and 1, but they want to have it change over time or they want it to be random. So like I put in the comments here, so this first part is just trying to get a number between 1 and 0. and we're going to multiply that by a number between 0 and 1, and then we're going to multiply that by the sprite size, which is 64 in this case. Because if we don't have the full sprite size, it will only smoosh to half. So you see how when we take half of the sprite size, it's only covering 32 pixels of squishing. And if you would multiply it, it would go twice as far. So again, when you're working on these, make sure that you use floats pretty much for everything. Uh, the UV is always going to be in a float, and if you try and just put an integer, it will probably yell at you like this and be, tell you to use a float instead of an int. Also with the semicolons, it will yell at you quite a bit for not putting semicolons at the end. Uh, let's see, I don't want to have that. So now we're going to adjust the vertex X also, so that way it shrinks to this midpoint. Now we can have it, if we shrink to one of the corners, we're adding the negative UVX, which will get bigger as it goes to the right. If we put 1 here, it'll go from the other side. And so I want it to go to the middle, so we'll go 0.5. Like I was saying with this, we're just trying to get a number between 0 and 1. So I highly encourage you to go through and change these things to cosine, see how that changes things. Um, you can get all different types of formations that would be rather difficult to do an animation player. It's not impossible, but it's just a simple line of code here that once you figure out the formula, you can make the shader do all different types of things. So going back to it shrinking to the middle. This would be a quick and simple way to have an enemy die and not have to have death animation sprites. That's one way to just 
use these vertex shaders. And the other main reason, which I'll put a link in the description to GDQuest's video, they have one for water, how to make the sprite look like there's waves and distortions in it. And that's the other main uh, example I can find for a vertex shader, uh, whether it's heat or water waves and ripples. I'm just trying to show you what's possible in very few lines of code so you can kind of digest what's actually happening opposed to having a super long shader. So the one that shows where you're off screen. So in this shader, what we're going to do is we're going to get the distance to the player in form of a vector 2 from the GD script, which I'll show you in just a minute. And then we're going to add to the X vertex how far left or right it needs to go. And we're going to add to the Y vertex how high or how low it needs to go, and we will clamp it so it stays on the screen. Now, when you get positions from a node or really any position, it's usually going to be in the upper left-hand corner, so you just have to take that into account when you want to decide where you want to clamp your image to, because you don't want half of the image to be off of the screen. This kind of defeats the purpose. So we want to clamp it a little bit less than halfway, because like I said, there's 530 to the edge, and I want to make sure I can fit the sprite inside. Now, I'll show you what it looks like when you don't do that. I just went a little bit in, and it looks good on the top, but it doesn't look very good on the bottom. See how it stops and it leaves a little gap? That gap is probably a little bit too big, but you can adjust that. But when you come to the bottom, it kind of goes over the edge a little bit, and that's not very good. Now, when you go over, and it goes down to the bottom, it catches it a little bit earlier, and it looks good. Now, to send this distance to the shader, we're going to look in here. So every frame in the physics process, we're going to see if the bubble should be active. So we will need a Boolean to keep track of whether the bubble should be active or not. And then we will measure the distance from the player to that off-screen bubble. The bubble never actually moves. We're just going to move where the image is projected to. So we're going to set that parameter to that distance. Now, how we're going to check to see if the bubble is active in the player, on the player, I added a visibility notifier 2D. And all that's going to do is see if the player is on the screen or off the screen. So we'll set a signal to tell us whether we've exited and or if we've entered the screen. Now, it's not very good practice to just set uh, functions directly from another node, but for right now we're just going to quickly do it instead of dealing with signals. We're going to send this boolean along to this function here where it will take that boolean and set the state to either true or false depending on whether we're on or off the screen, and the same with the visibility. So when we have that, we won't see it when we're on the screen, but we will see it when we're off the screen. Now, it's a little bit glitchy because there's a frame or two between when we make it visible and when it adjusts the position of it, and we'll have to figure that out. But for right now, I just want to show you how the vertex shader is working. And so, like I said, the position never changes. It's just going to sh project it to a different spot. So this one points to the player, and as you can see, the position never p changes. But when you move the player around, it measures the distance and it adjusts the size of your projection. So to see how this works in action a little bit better, we're going to remove this laser looking part of the shader since that's the fragment shader. And we're going to go over that in a future video because it's a little bit more difficult than I want to get into right now. I will show you all of the code so you can copy and paste it and play with it to get that laser. But for right now, we're just going to focus on the vertex. So what's happening is we're basically scaling the X and the Y vertexes. So that way it will follow the player around. As you can see, this looks kind of silly. The laser made a little bit more sense, uh, but this just gives a better image about what's actually happening. 
So we're scaling the projection of the sprite to follow the player. Now this is what the complete code looks like. So you can play around with it. We'll make a line using smooth step. And like I said, step and smooth step requires another video. We'll go over that soon. Then in the fragment set shader, we will actually use that function, this helper function that we've made. And we'll set the color of the laser to red and set that final color. Now again, we have this uniform where we have to measure the distance to the player. And it's a different spot in the physics process, but it's the same idea. So here, the point at the player, I actually measured to the midpoint of the player because, again, if you measure just to the player position, it'll measure to the upper left-hand corner of the player. So after we measure to about the midpoint of the player, we will set that shader param to our calculation. So if you have any questions about how this works or have any suggestions or ideas for what you would like to see, please let me know in the comments, and, and I hope you enjoyed these few shaders.